Okay, we are ready to continue on uh, chapter three on uh, aggregate planning, which we started last week. Uh, but first today I will go through the solution for assignment one uh, very shortly, because you, most of you have well, solved it very good. Uh, still, we, uh, there is a need for, uh, for going through and uh, uh, try to explain the solution. Because uh, at in, in particular for uh, the second problem, uh, you will have to continue in assignment uh, number two with the same uh, uh, data set. Uh, the first problem was about uh, mathematical uh, induction, and uh, here this uh, I have uploaded this uh, sheet in, in Fronter, so uh, you should be able to, uh, to look at the solution here. But uh, as we remember, uh, induction is based on first, you have the hypothesis, which means that uh, this is the formula or the statement which you want to prove. And here you are given a statement that uh, the sum of the series, looking like this, 2 plus 4 plus 6, 2 multiplied by n, what is important here, n is the index number of the, the, the factor in the series. So index number 1, when n is equal to 1, it means that the value of this uh, factor is 2. And then 4 and 6 and so on. Uh, and this... Um, uh, this uh, series, sum of a series, should then be equal to n multiplied by n plus 1. And we need to prove that by induction. So we have the hypothesis or the statement. The base case is needed to check first, which means that we have to check the first, the lowest index number, which is n equal to 1. And if n is equal to 1, it means that you have only 2 in the series here. And you have 1 multiplied by 1 plus 1, which of course also is 2. So here you have proven that the base, pa base case is correct. Uh, in the assumption step, we can just assume that since we have proven that the base case is correct, we can assume that for one particular value called k, the statement is still correct. So then you just have to replace the n, the variable n, with the k, which here is one particular number. You don't know about exactly which number it is, but that's not important because we will now prove in the induction step that uh, this n equal to k plus 1 still is correct, which means when you, when you increase from this number by 1, the formula will still be uh, correct. And this is done like this. You look at the series which is the same for the first k numbers. And you add one more 2 multiplied by k plus 1 in this case. And since it is already uh, proven or assumed in, in uh, the previous step that uh, this series up to 2k can be replaced by the formula k plus k plus 1, we can just put that in here, add the new uh, new factor here, 2 multiplied by k plus 1. And in the formula on the right hand side, just replace n with k plus 1, which will give us k plus 1 multiplied by k plus 2 here. And simplify this expression, and we find out that the right hand side is equal to the left hand side. So then the formula is proven correct. We have the hypothesis. We check that the hypothesis is correct for the base case, the lowest possible number. Then we can assume that it is correct for one particular number, and we prove that it's still correct when it's increased by one. Since one is correct, this proves that two will also be correct. And since two is correct, this will prove that n equal to three is still correct, and so on. And we will continue for by increasing by one at a time. So that was the first induction problem. The second one, of course, the steps are the same. First, we have an hypothesis. We have a series of numbers, which we should prove is equal to the formula on the right-hand side. Check for the base case. The base case here, n equal to 1, the only, the first uh, factor in this series, which is 1. And 1 should be equal to 1 multiplied by 2 multiplied by 1 minus 1, which is, of course, also 1. 
the base case is correct. Since the base case is correct, we can assume that it is correct for one particular number k. And we will prove by increasing by 1, put n equal to k plus 1, this formula is still correct. Uh, same principle, use the first uh, series here, which is equal to the previous, the assumption step, and replace that part with the formula on the right hand side. And then it should be a well, straightforward case to simplify the expression and find uh, or check if the right hand side is equal to the left hand side, which is the case here. So, problem two about regression analysis. You're given this uh, problem about the sales of Nintendo uh, GameCube in 2002. And we saw that we had, well, quite stable sales at the first 10 months. And then in November and December, we had a quite uh, large uh, increase of the demand. And you were asked to use the regression analysis. And we rem remember regression analysis is uh, a well, can be used as a forecasting method for trend-based series. So you will find a line which is best fitted to the 12 data points in 2002, like this. Uh, it's also shown here, but I also uploaded a, uh, an Excel sheet with the calculations. But uh, looking at the formulas here, we remember that for regression analysis we need to find the SXY and the SXX parameter by the formulas here. Uh, and when we have these parameters, we are able to find the gradient, the B value, which means how much this uh, line will increase from one period to the next one. And when we have the B value, we can also calculate the A value. And the A value is where this trend line will meet the y-axis when x is equal to, to 0. And with a value of a and b, we will easily find the formula for the trend line, looking like this. That, uh, yeah, the b value, uh, approximately 36,496.6. And then the a value, 41, minus 41,746.1. So then the formula will be equal to this. The demand or the estimated demand according to the trend line will be the A value plus the B value multiplied by the number of periods. And then the, the graph will look like this. The first year, 2002, is here. And then you have a well, pretty good estimation. But then you can see that you will increase for every new period. And you will end up with a demand, or an, an estimated demand, which is much higher than the actual demand. Because what we see here on this product is this uh, typical Christmas gift. And it's sold much more in November and, th and December than the other months of the year. It's a very clear uh, seasonal trend here, even if you have some different sizes here for uh, uh, for the the peak months it is still very clear that it will sell much more in the, the well around Christmas November and December than the other months of the year so this is now the well answer for for B very simple answer in this case sometimes uh, well you have more theoretical questions in the in in the later uh, assignments so then you should try to analyze more but at least here, you can see that the predicted values will increase gradually during the period, while the sales and, uh, are relatively stable for most of the year, but peak periods in November and December, which we can clearly see on the graph here. And problem C, you're asked about the reason. And of course, also here, a very simple answer. It's obvious that this is a product with seasonal variation. And a method for predicting seasonal series will be better. And that, that's what you should do in assignment number two, where you should use Winter's method, uh, which is uh, a triple exponential smoothing method. Uh, some of you have suggested Holtz method here, but that's not correct, but because Holtz method is also a method which only are able to predict a trend, not seasons. So you should use 
preferably Winter's method, which is uh, uh, stated in, in assignment number two as, uh, as the method you should try for finding a better model for predicting the sales for, uh, uh, on, on this uh, product about uh, Nintendo GameCube in the start of the 2000 uh, year, 2002 to 2005. So that's assignment number one. Some of you have uh, delivered uh, paper copies. You can have them back because I've scanned them for my archive. So we'll like put them here and you can take them in the, in the break. So then let's continue to uh, chapter three about aggregate planning, which we started last week. And uh, we'll go to the slide about aggregate units, which we presented uh, uh, an example on, because uh, aggregate units is something which is often used in, in, uh, uh, in both in forecasting and also in production planning. And aggregate units might be, well, some of the examples here, you have actual units of production, might happen that you are uh, forecasting a given number of actual units. That could be the best case in some situations. Uh, weight is another one. Tons of steel is the example here. If you have products which is uh, well natural to, to measure in, in, a, in, in weights, then you might use that as a, an aggregate unit. Uh, we also have volume. If you are produc uh, producing liquids, for example, gallons of gasoline, then the, the volume would usually be the, the aggr natural <laughs> aggregate unit. Sometimes you want to use uh, currency, dollars or kroner or anything. And you could sometimes find that a fictionous aggregate unit is the best unit to use for uh, forecasting, forecasting and production planning. And we saw one example on that. Uh, this is uh, different models of washing machines. Uh, they are uh, well, different uh, of in, in uh, how advanced they are and how uh, expensive they are. We have the simplest model here, which is given as 4.2 hours as um, in, in production time. So you need 4.2 working hours to produce this simple model. Uh, the more advanced models will use some more production hours. And the price will also increase, 285 for the cheapest one, and up to 725 for the most expensive one. And there is a symmetry here that the number of working hours will increase and the price will increase because they are these washing machines probably have some, some more advanced uh, features. And we can also see here that the percentage sales is higher, so most people will buy the cheapest one and less people will buy the more, uh, more advanced and more expensive uh, models of, of the washing machines. So the question here is how to define an aggregate unit to use in, in forecasting and, and production planning. Washing machines are, well, they are quite similar products. Um, I'm not sure about what is the exact difference here, but they will probably have lots of similar or uh, components which are common, and the difference might be so, some more uh, extra components in, in the more advanced uh, models here. So it's not always so easy to know about the exact percentage of sales or the, uh, how, how the distribution of the sales will be between the, uh, the models. It's uh, more easy to have an estimate or to try to forecast how many people will buy a washing machine in the next periods then you might have some good, uh, find some good estimates, but how they will, the distribution will be, how many will buy this model and this model and this model, uh, is maybe not so easy. So if you are making separate models for all of them, you have a much higher error mar margin or probability of error if, than if you try to, to make a common forecast for all these models of, of washing machines. And then when you have a given forecast, you can use this percentage 
uh, to try to uh, to find the distribution between the different uh, different models. That will usually give a better estimate than if you are trying to make exact um, forecast for each of, of the models. So the aggregate units in this example is uh, suggested to uh, to be like this. Uh, 32 percent multiplied by 4.2, which we remember was the num working time for the simplest machine. So you uh, multiply the percentage of the demand by how much time it's used for, uh, for producing each of the machine. And then you sum all these together and you find a number which is 4.8644 worker hours for one aggregate unit. which lays around here. So the aggregate units, unit in this case are quite similar to the second cheapest model of, of, of the washing machines here. So this is a way to use aggregate units, try to combine forecasts for products which are quite close or quite, quite similar to make a better forecast and uh, better be able to use, uh, use the, the forecasting method and also uh, production uh, planning. So let's now continue on uh, looking at uh, how to make a production plan for uh, this particular example. Uh, example not in the textbook, but I will go through this um, uh, particular example for this washing machine, uh, which we now assume that we have uh, have an aggregate uh, unit, which is a combination of the uh, eight, uh, of the different models of this uh, washing machine. So, here we are given information about the forecasted demand for the eight months, January to August. And you're also given information about starting inventory at the end of December, which is 200, which means that you have already 200 items on stock, and the demand in January are 420, which means that you don't have to produce 420 because you already have 200. You can produce only 220 and use and sell those who are already on stock. But at the end of the planning period in August, you should also would you, you would like to have 100 units on hand. This is for well, some some reason not given here. So you should now try to find a monthly production level for this particular problem. And as we can see, it is varying quite much. January 420 minus 200 means 220. And then 280, March 460, quite a high demand in March, not so much in April. And then May quite much, and you will have not so much in the summer month, but in August 125, and you need to include 100, which you should have on hand according to the production plan. So let's now try to make a table and try to find a more uh, well, we will look at different examples on production plan for plans for, for this particular uh, example. So, we will look at the forecast, which we now will use. We assume that we have a good uh, uh, forecasting method, and we can use the forecast for creating a production plan for these months. So these are the eight month, and we remember start with January. The forecast say 420, but we don't need to produce 420 because we already have 200 on stock. So what is needed is 220. And then we continue with the numbers for February, March, and so on. For 60, sorry, and uh, 190, 310, 145, 110, and we remember in August we have a forecast of 125, but 
we need to add 100 because we should have 100 on stock at the end of the uh, planning period, which means 225 in total. So what we now would like to do, find out how should we produce, uh, how much should we produce in each month, how many people do we need to employ for meeting this production plan. And what we then should do is to try first find the cumulative demand. How much do we need to produce up to each of the periods given? Cumulative uh, demand. Okay, in January, we need to produce at least 220. In February, we need to have produced 220 for January demand and 280 for February demand, which means a total of 500. We can produce 500 in January and still have enough to meet the demand of February. That's an po a possible option here. Uh, but still, in February, we need to have at least 500 units because that is what we need for the previous months. And then in March, we need to add 460, which means 960 for January, February, and March. We need a total of 960. And so we can continue, just add the next period's demand to find the cumulative demand up to that particular month. So this will now be the column showing the cumulative demand up to each of the eight months. In the last month, which is in August, we need to have produced 1,940 units to be able to meet the demand for all these eight months. <coughs> Yeah, <laughs> because that, that, that is quite important, because this is uh, uh, well, also often given in, um, uh, in uh, problem text and so on. You need to adjust uh, the act actual demand or the forecasted demand are 420, but you have starting inventory as 200. So this number is 420 minus 200, which is what we need to produce in January. We have 200 on stock and we can sell them to meet uh, some of the, the actual demand. And the same in the last month. The actual demand in August is 125, but you would like to have 100 uh, units in, uh, on hand at the end of the uh, planning period in August. So then the total number to be produced in August is 225. <coughs> So, this is the same uh, table with the cumulative uh, demand. And if we put, the make a graph with these numbers, we can see the graph which is here. Start on 220, then 500, 960, and so on. And this is the graph which tells the cumulative demand for all these eight months. So now, one way to make a production plan, well, we can try. We need a total of 1,940 in eight months, which means we can produce an average of 1,940 divided by eight, which is 242.5. If we produce 242 and a half uh, machine every month, then we are able to meet the demand in August. But then we still have a problem. Because 242.5 
Then we will start approximately here, and we will have a line which looks like this. And we can clearly see here that in March, and April, and May, and even June, we will have a stock out. Because up to these months, we are not able to, to meet the cumulative demand. 242.5 multiplied by 3 should be uh, 740 or something. Uh, no, 730. Yeah, never mind. It will be much less than the actual demand of 960. So, in March, we will have a stock out. Of course, in some, um, in some markets with some products, this is perfectly okay because then you would just say to the customer, uh, well, we don't have it on stock now, but come back next week or next month, and then uh, we will have it. Uh, we, we will have a new delivery, or we have, will have a pr produced enough. And the customers are willing to wait. In some markets, this is possible. In other markets, they will go to the company next door and buy the product there or a similar product there. So then you will lose the sale. So, uh, and this is something uh, we need to consider when we are making the production plan. Question. That's also, uh, well, washing machine, it's hard to see uh, a half a washing machine. It's not ready for sales, <laughs> but it, it may, might be produced uh, half finished. So uh, while well, you have started production, and, and this is a, a continuous process, so, so this is, uh, it, it's okay to think that we, you might have a, a fractional uh, product, but of course you're not able to sell it. In some, uh, if you are talking about uh, liquids or weights, for example, this is okay, you can sell half a ton or uh, half a gallon or liter or, or anything. So, so all such things that you need to think about uh, uh, which type of product this is about. And uh, in, in uh, assignments and exams and, so on, uh, and, and things like that, I will not uh, consider if you are rounding to the closest integer, that's perfectly okay. Or if you're using fraction, this is perfectly okay. Uh, if it's not stated directly that you should use integers or fractions, for example, that could also happen in, in some problems. But here we have, well, let's call it a, a problem. At, at least we have a challenge that uh, our production plan, simple production plan of 242.5, will give us a stock out in some of the month, even if you are able to meet the total demand over the full planning period. But if we will. Um, Uh, if if we, uh, we are now talking about what we call the constant workforce plan, which is also one, uh, one of the topics in your, in your assignment. So if you want to have a production plan which is able to meet the demand in all the periods, then you need to adjust. Uh, what I just showed was uh, here that you are making a straight line from the origin to 1940. Uh, and the slope of the line is the number of units to produce each month, which in this case 242.5. But as we saw, then you will have a line looking like this, with a stock out in almost all the periods between the first and, and the last period. And if you have a product which is not able to, or, or where you don't want to calculate with, uh, with stock outs, you might lose the sales or you might lose so much money uh, if you have a, a stock out that you will, you will not risk that, then you need to adjust this line. And adjusting the line, make a parallel displacement or different scales here, so we can go back to the previous and see here. If we should try to meet the demand for all the months, we need to displace this line. So it is meeting the what we call the critical month, which is in this case March. We can see here displacing this line until it meets the graph or it uh, is uh, going outside the graph here. And the last point here is the demand for March or the cumulative demand for March, 960. And if we are now producing 960 units in three months, 
this will mean that uh, the total number to produce is 960 divided by 3 is 320. And producing 320, then you will always have more demand or more items produced than you have on uh, you, you have for, for the demand. So let's try to see. 320 is more than the demand in January. 640, of course, this is also cumulative, the total number up to that month. 640 in January and February exact 960 in March, which we found was the critical month, and then 1280, 1600, 1920, 2240, and 2560, was that correct? Anyway, you can see that uh, the cumulative production in this case will always be higher than or equal to the cumulative demand. Which means that you have a plan which are able to meet the demand in all the months. And this is the same example with another scale. So here the production line has been displaced to meet exactly the production to the demand in the critical month. But what we now can see, we have a very high overproduction in the last months here. And this is also shown by the difference of the cumulative demand line and the cumulative production line here. The space between here is overproduction and we know that storing inventory is always costly. If you have a stock, uh, you have to invest some uh, money, which you could have used on, on other uh, things. You have to insure the stock, for example, in, in need to pay insurance. You might have a, a risk of, of breakage and, uh, and such things. There are always some costs in, uh, and, and of course you need to uh, have people to in, in the storage area to handle all this uh, inventory. So there's always a cost in, uh, included when you are storing inventory. And here you have well, lots of overproduction and if you are utilizing all the production capacity you will have so many items extra on, on stock which will be rather costly. So here even if you are able to in this production plan to meet the the, the demand against the production uh, for the critical month, you will end up with a large stock, which is uh, totally uh, unnecessary. So, um, in total, yeah, you can also see that the stock here, the inventory, will now be the difference between the production and the demand is 100, 140, this is 0, 130, 140, it is 315, 525, and 620. This is the number of items on stock when the period is over. And you, all, you will have a total, if you sum all this together, a total of 1,970 items, which is stored from one month to the next month. They might be the same items, or uh, they might be, uh, well, the, you use the first in, first out uh, strategy, then you sell out the oldest item from, from the stock, but still, you are storing 1,970 items from one month to the next month which is rather costly. And in addition, you had 100 items extra here, which also is extra inventory. Even if you, you adjusted the plan to meet the, uh, well, the strategy of, uh, uh, of having 100 extra at the end of the, the planning period. So you also need to pay uh, or include a cost for storing these 100 inventories. So this plan is rather uh, costly. 
but still you are able to meet the demand in the critical month. So what you usually, uh, well, company usually uh, does if um, if this is the problem, and then they might have people going going idle, uh, or they can send them to another part of the production plant, or, or make them do uh, other things. They don't have to produce all these items because it's not necessary. We don't need all these items, but you have much extra production capacity by using uh, following this plan. So. Another thing, this is a rather simplified model. This is the same uh, table as we have on the blackboard. Uh, this is, uh, as mentioned, rather uh, simplified uh, and may not be realistic for several uh, reasons. Because it may not be possible to achieve the production level of 320 units per month with an integer number of workers. That is one thing uh, you might, of course, employ workers uh, in fractional position. At least you can employ a person for 50% position or 75% posi uh, percent position and so on, but not all fractions are possible. Um, also, there are, of course, uh, some uh, uncertainties here. You are not uh, uh, certain that the workers uh, will use exactly the time uh, time needed, the same time. There could be skilled workers, there could be new workers, which uh, might be more or less effective and so on. So there will always be some some kind of, of uncertainty and uh, uh, it's not, uh, well, to make an accurate forecast, it's not always uh, so, so easy. Uh, and another thing which makes this plan a bit unrealistic is that here it's assumed that you have a given production for each month. January has 31 days, February normally 28 days. Uh, you don't know how many of these are working days. It depends on the weekends and so on. So, but, uh, but anyway, the number of working days might be different in different weeks. In March or April, you usually will have the, the Easter holidays and then you will miss some, no normally miss some working days there. So, it is not exactly realistic to think that you can produce with the same number of workers, you can pr produce exactly the same amount for each month. In June, July, August, you might also have holidays, so you need to, to give the workers uh, some weeks uh, off, for example. So, even if this is a well, uh, it's a production plan which are able to meet, uh, or theoretically at least, meet the uh, total demand for the critical month. We might need to adjust it to, um, to find a more uh, realistic plan than, than this one. So let's now assume that we rather, uh, or we also want to include the number of working days to make a more realistic plan for production here. Since the number of working days are usually different in different uh, months. And the exact production, they can be, well, difficult to achieve. You, of course, you have also talk, uh, talked about the number of workers, which we so far have assumed is uh, constant, and this is also called the, the constant workforce plan and we will see some other strategies later. But uh, uh, so far we will look at the number of workers as, uh, as a constant, and, uh, but the, the variable will now be uh, the, the number of days, which also will of course decide the cumulative uh, production or, or the production in each of the, the months. So then what we need to find is how many units each worker are able to produce in per unit time, per day, for example, which is the, the most common. And then we talk about what we call the K factor. And the K factor is defined to be the number of units produced denoted as the U, 
Uh, and this, this is uh, based on historical data. So to find the K factor, you have to look at the historical uh, data for a given time period and see how many units were produced, how many days did you use to produce them, units, number of units, divided by the number of days. And also, you need to see how many workers were involved in producing this units. So in our example, we can assume that we have produced 520 units in 40 days by 38 workers. 38 workers have been employed in 40 days and they were able to produce 520 units, which gives us a value here, which is a fraction, 0 0.3421. And this is the, the K factor. Uh, and this is, the, of course, the, the average number of units. Uh, I just mentioned that we, we might have skilled workers, which uh, can work faster. We might have new workers, which need some more time. And there also are usually some well, difference in, in uh, efficiency on, on different workers, but this is the, the average value. And since we now are talking about well, quite a long period, 40 days, 38 workers for 40 days, then this average value can be used as the k-factor also for making production plans into uh, the future. So this is the next step here. Try to include the number of days in each month and make a cumulative uh, production plan according to the number of workers, the number of days, and the K factor. Then we'll take a break and continue this example in 15 minutes.